Hello everyone, this is Jerome Waddle, and welcome to today's reading, which will be from sermon number two of the seven sermons to the dead, from Scrutinies in the Red Book. If you miss the intro in sermon number one, the clickable link is in the description. To review sermon one, the term floroma is a Gnostic word that was introduced as being both fullness and nothingness or emptiness. This parallels the Buddhist ideas of form does not differ from emptiness, emptiness does not differ from form, that which is form is emptiness, that which is emptiness form. Also relates to the Chinese Tao that's not the Tao. And in modern physics, it parallels the wave particle phenomenology of appearance and disappearance. In all these cases, you could perhaps think of it as an all pervading force that we are all swimming in and as timeless. The Pleroma is the beginning and end of creation. And then Sermon 1 describes our essence as creation that is confined in time and space and strives toward differentiation from the qualities of opposites. The polar opposites are described. In my view, this is where the teaching begins, where it is wrong to identify with only one element from a pair of opposites, as the other element will eventually take over and seize us. As you know, the point is that young psychology is aimed at self-awareness and self-knowledge that even today is not widely known. Before reading sermon number two, here's some of the terms used. Helios is the Greek sun god, sometimes called the Titan, who drove a chariot daily from east to west across the sky and sailed around the northerly stream of the ocean each night in a huge cup. And Abraxas, who stands above the sun god and the devil that represents effective force, duration, and change. Abraxas was a Gnostic facility figure as being a great archon who was Historically portrayed as an icon with the head of a cock or a lion, the body of a man, and his legs are serpents that terminate in scorpions. And his right hand, he grabs a frail or a club, and in his left hand is a round or oval shield. Now the reading of Sermon 2. That night, Philemon stood behind me, and the dead drew near and lined the walls and cried, We want to know about God. Where is God? Is God dead? But Philemon rose and said, and this is the second sermon to the dead, God is not dead. He is alive as ever. God is creation, for he is something definite and therefore differentiated from the Pleroma. God is a quality of the Pleroma, and everything I have said about creation also applies to him. But he is distinct from creation in that he is much more indefinite and indeterminable. He is less differentiated than creation, since the ground of his essence is effective fullness. Only in so far as he is definite and differentiated is he creation, and as such, he is the manifestation of the effective fullness of the Pleroma. Everything that we do not differentiate falls into the Pleroma and is canceled out by its opposite. If therefore we do not differentiate God, effective fullness is canceled out of us. Moreover, 
God is the throne itself, just as each smallest point in the created and uncreated is the throne itself. Effective emptiness is the essence of the devil. God and devil are the first manifestations of nothingness, which we call the Pharaoh. It makes no difference whether Pharaoh exists or not, since it cancels itself out completely. Not so, creation. Insofar as God and the devil are created beings, they do not cancel each other out, but stand one against the other as effective opposites. We need no proof of their existence. It is enough that we have to keep speaking about them. Even if both were not, creation would forever distinguish them anew out of the Paroma on account of their distinct essences. Everything that differentiation takes out of the Paroma is a pair of opposites. Therefore, the devil always belongs to God. This inseparability is most intimate, and as you know from experience, as indissoluble in your life as the Pharaoh itself. Since both stand very close to the Pharaoh, in which all opposites are canceled out and united, fullness and emptiness, generation and destruction are what distinguish God and the devil. Effectiveness is a common to both. Effectiveness joins them. Effectiveness, therefore, stands above both and is a God above God since it unites fullness and emptiness through its effectuality. This is a God you knew nothing about because mankind forgot him. We call him by his name, Abraxas. He is even more indefinite than God in the devil. To distinguish him from God, we call God Helios, or Son, S-U-N. Avraxas is effect. Nothing stands opposed to him but the ineffective. Hence, his effective nature unfolds itself freely. The ineffective neither exists nor resists. Avraxas stands above the sun and above the devil. He is improbable probability, that which takes unreal effect. If the Pharaoh had an essence, Avraxas would be its manifestation. He is the effectual itself, not any particular effect, but effect in general. He takes unreal effect because he has no definite effect. He is also creation, since he is distinct from the Pharaoh. The sun has a definite effect, and so does the devil. Therefore, they appear to us more effective than the indefinite of Raxus. He is forced duration and change. The dead now raised a great tumult, for they were Christians. But when Philemon had ended his speech, one after another, the dead also stepped back into the darkness once more, and the noise of their outrage gradually died away in the distance. When all the clamor had passed, I turned to Philemon and exclaimed, Phidias, wisest one, you take from men the gods to whom they could pray. You take alms from the beggar, bread from the hungry, fire from the freezing. Philemon answered and said, My son, these dead have had to reject the belief of the Christians, and therefore they pray to no God. So, should I teach them a God in whom they can believe and whom they can pray? That is precisely what they have rejected. Why did they reject it? They had to reject it because they could not do otherwise. And why did they have no other choice? Because the world, without these men knowing it, entered into that month of the great year where one should believe only what one knows. That is difficult enough, but 
it is also a remedy for the long sickness that arose from the fact that no one believed what one did not know. I teach them the God whom both I and they know of without being aware of him, a God in whom one does not believe and to whom one does not pray, but of whom one knows. I teach this God to the dead since they desired entry and teaching, but I do not teach them to living men since they do not desire my teaching. Why indeed should I teach them? Therefore, I take them away from them, no kindly error of prayers, their Father in heaven. What concern is my foolishness to the living? The dead need salvation, since they are a great waiting flock hovering over their graves, and long for the knowledge that belief and the rejection of belief have breathed their last. But whoever has fallen ill, and his near death wants knowledge, and he sacrifices pardon. It appears, I replied, as if you teach a terrible and dreadful God beyond measure to whom good and evil and human suffering and joy are nothing. My son, said Philemon, did you not see that these dead had a God of love and rejected him? Should I teach them a loving God? They had to reject him after already having long since rejected the evil God whom they call the devil. Therefore, they must know a God to whom everything created is nothing because he himself is the creator and everything created and the destruction of everything created. Have they not rejected a God who is a father, a lover, good and beautiful, one whom they thought to have particular qualities and of a particular being. Therefore, I must teach a God to whom nothing can be attributed, who has all qualities and therefore none, because only I and they can know such a God. But how, O oh my Father, can men unite in such a God? Does the knowledge of such a God not amount to destroying human bonds in every society based on the good and the beautiful? Philemon answered, these dead rejected the God of love of the good and the beautiful. They had to reject him, and so they rejected unity and community and love in the good and beautiful, and thus they killed one another and dissolved the community of men should I teach them a God who united them in love and whom they rejected? Therefore, I teach them the God who dissolves unity, who blasts everything human, who powerfully creates and mightily destroys. Those whom love does not unite, fear compels. And as Philemon spoke these words, he bent down swiftly to the ground touched it with his hand, and disappeared. Thank you for listening. That's the end of Sermon 2. And stay tuned for Sermon number 3. Thank you.